Hello, hello, and welcome to Grad Chat by PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be a bit more difficult to talk about in our day to day. I'm your host, Linda, and I'm finishing up my master's in food science in Ireland. And for PhD Balance, I'm the Grad Chat lead and a Twitter coordinator. Don't forget to subscribe to Grad Chat on your chosen platform to get notifications about new episodes. And if you feel like it, maybe leave us a rating or review. It helps people find the show. Our topic today is boundaries, and I'm very excited to welcome our guest, Julia Jones. Julia is a scientist, coach, and founder of the Academic Life Community. With over two decades of experience in academia, Julia studied and worked at institutions across seven countries. She holds two master's degrees in biology and in demography, and earned her PhD in zoology from the University of Oxford in 2015. In 2020, Julia has completed a life and business coaching program, and she also is currently completing a BS uh, bachelor's in psychology at the University of Southern Denmark. These days, Julia runs a learning platform and community to support academics in achieving their academic goals while maintaining their physical and mental well-being. She regularly shares insights around mental health and academia through her blog, workshops, and group training programs. So welcome, Julia. We're so pleased to have you on Grad Chat to discuss um, boundaries. Um, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm very well. It's a it's a beautiful morning here in Denmark. The sun is shining, and I'm very happy to be here. Okay, it's great. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I guess to dive right in, boundaries are a very big topic, and they're something that um a lot of us can struggle with. So I guess to start with, for people who know nothing about boundaries, what are they? You know what, I've actually thought about this quite a lot because boundaries is such a term we throw around and we hear everywhere and it's like, and for me it's until I really understood in depth what it really means, I'm like, I can't really handle this, like what is this? So, and I, um, I, I read a book, which I can very much recommend. It's called uh, Set Boundaries, Find Peace by uh, a licensed therapist. She's called uh, Nedra Tawab. And, and when I read the book, I finally realized it's actually super simple. A boundary is just in a relationship to say, this is okay, and this is not okay. And relationship includes the relationship to ourself. That is, that's a really great definition. Really simple. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's like it takes this sort of abstract concept and turns it into something. Oh, okay, I need to say what's okay and what's not okay, because that also immediately connects to why is this important for us that we do that, and how come that we don't do that? Like, how is it that we don't actually define in our relationship what's okay and what's not okay? Because a lot of our our difficulties come from the fact that we don't do that, that we don't set boundaries in our work relationships and our friendships and the relationships to our families. So for, I think everyone can benefit from, from uh, taking this topic up as a, as a sort of topic of the month for self-development or however you want to call it and, and really dive into and thinking about it and thinking especially about it, like what are the areas of my life where I'm not boundaried, where I let people like come into my territory. And the reason or the way we know when we don't have our boundaries where they should um, where we would benefit from having them is because then we have feelings that our feelings, you know, very clearly show us, okay, this is not okay, because we react with frustration, we react with anger, we react with, we feel unheard, we feel unseen, we feel unappreciated. Um, and of course, these are all feelings that then make us react in a specific way to the person in question again and that then can tip a relationship into being a toxic relationship or even deteriorate the relationship to the point where we cut people off so if we want to talk about boundaries and uh, and restrict it in a way to the to the phd experience then of course many people will immediately think of how do I set boundaries at my workplace towards my colleagues or towards my my advisor or supervisor so that's very central I think absolutely um I think that is 
very, very important. Um, boundaries, we always love to hear people talking about them, um, but they can be very, very hard to implement. They can be very hard to even start. Like you said, we feel frustrated, but actually implementing those boundaries is very difficult. Yes. Um, so do you have any tips, I guess, or advice about how people should go about starting to implement those boundaries or starting to figure yes. out even where they are? Yes. Um, so everything always starts with awareness. Everything, the moment you hear about something and you start uh, pointing your awareness at it, you actually automatically set the process going where you start realizing things or noticing things in your day to day. But especially at work, <clears throat> uh, it's, I would start with, with trying to be really aware of what are the situations where I where I react, where I, where feelings come up, where feelings take over that are pointing towards that there is a boundary, boundary violation happening here that's not okay for me. And then just notice for a while. And I think it can be helpful to think about um, what different types of boundaries there are. So, I mean, it varies a little bit from, you know, different theories, different authors, but I think there's a general consensus that there is um, a boundary around physical space. So who do I allow into my physical space and how close, but also do people re um, respect my physical space, for example, um, my spot on the lap bench or my desk, um, my things as well, and of course, touch. Like, do I allow people to touch me? How do I react to that? And then there's uh, sexual boundaries, which are hopefully not of concern in the workplace, but of course they can. Um, however, let's say we park this as a, this is a very big topic to the side right now for the workplace. Um, there's emotional boundaries, like what is it, what, what feelings, I, is it okay for me to bring my feelings to work? Can I be sad? Can I be happy? Can I be enthusiastic? Can I be curious and ask? Can I, uh, can I be in this space with my feelings? Are they, are they, are they um, respected? And then there's, of course, very important for, for the academic setting, the intellectual boundaries. Is my opinion val valid, um, valued? Uh, are people listening to what I have to say as are people receptive to my ideas? Is, are my ideas equally worthy than another person's ideas? So these are kind of also as a, as a, as a, as a field where we have boundaries where when they are violated, we notice, but we're actually maybe not aware that that is what's happening. For example, when we sit in a meeting, I mean, if we want to take the classical example of men's planning, so I have been in meetings where I said something and then a senior male academic said the same thing and got the, you know, and suddenly the room was like, oh yeah, this is a wonderful thing or a wonderful aspect, wonderful thing to think about. So why is it that my idea is not valued in this context the same as someone else's? And then there's um, material, um, which is which is a bit related to physical space, but is of course, like, what are my things and how do people treat my things? Are they using them without asking me and so on? Uh, and then there's time. And time is a very, very, very big one for academics because we're constantly stressed and pressured. Um, so boundaries around time is also the one that is probably most critical for grad students to both define in relationship to themselves, like how do I use my time, but also of course in relationship, especially to their, to the people in their work life that have expectations of them. Um, so I think to go about beginning to set boundaries at first is helpful to split this up into these different areas and then really begin to notice where do I have where do I have problem fields you know where do I where do I have situations where I start to get activated where I start to have an experience that tells me okay this is not okay because connecting this back to this is not okay this is actually a very simple thing you know a boundary is just to create an environment for us and to set up our relationships so can that we can act and interact with other people in a way that we think this is okay um, we are in our zone of tolerance so we can 
you know, it can be it can be very comfortable, it can be slightly discomfortable, but not beyond that. Um, yeah, so I think that the question going back to how to set a boundary is that we notice we notice first we build the awareness and then I think there's still a very um, cognitive process of really sitting down and writing down. I mean, a writing works for very for many people very well because our mind is a monkey mind and it jumps from one thing to the next. So what we write down is actually down and we can organize our thoughts. So I'm a big, big, big um, fan of journaling uh, and recommend that to everyone who's trying to to really get deliberate and conscious about how they how they create their life um, and to to define what's okay and what's not okay maybe when we when we start setting boundaries it is it is very useful to start with something very small you know so um maybe don't start right away by telling your supervisor you don't want to work past 4 p.m anymore or something but maybe start with with something small like your colleague taking your things without asking or something like that um i think as a little side note as well generally when we talk about boundaries we kind of come from the perspective that we are not boundaried enough so that is called porous boundaries so that we don't have clearly defined um, where is where is the threshold or where is the boundary for me but it can actually also be the other way around and that's equally unhealthy for us to live a, a happy fulfilled life is when we have too rigid boundaries, when we have set everything up so that we keep everyone out. And of course, this is also something that we usually, you know, comes from something we carry from childhood where we, where we had to learn to, to keep ourselves safe. And that was a, as a coping mechanism and it worked very well. But now it stops us from building meaningful connections at work collaborations, um, having friendships and so on. So there's basically as with everything almost in life, the pendulum can swing both ways and we're gonna to try to, to be somewhere in the center. Yeah. So that's, uh, I, I basically can keep talking about this, but I don't know how. Also, no, awesome. Feel free to keep talking as much as you yeah. want. I'm just gonna say, I did not consider how many different types of boundaries there were. Um, I was really shocked by that but I think myself I'm really really bad at the time boundary I don't respect my own time I'm working on it but yeah. it's really really hard <laughs> yeah yeah and it is it is really really hard because it connects to so many aspects of of uh, our whole being so it's that's why I say also beginning become deliberate about boundary setting and start at something small um the thing is that um, when we begin to set boundaries, so maybe maybe going going into thinking about how do I actually set a boundary because that's still again something quite abstract, and it actually is a sentence that starts with "I need," "I want," "I expect," and then put some content behind that, and a full stop, and and then do the work of enforcing and respecting that boundary that we just set so it can be as simple as if you borrow my um statistic book i expect you to put it back on the shelf that would be a material boundary or um i can meet you next thursday to talk this through with you but i have 30 minutes time for this uh, and then I need to go. That's also a, a time boundary, right? So it's um, it's it's as as with many thing, uh, many things is you know clarity is kind. So it's as as clear as possible, um, and I think very many people tend to apologize at the same time as setting a boundary. There's also cultures that apologize more than others. Um, and in this case, I don't think an apology is necessary. Uh, I think an apology is already a dilution of 
how much you mean what you just said. Um, and then I also would recommend not to over explain, just to keep it short, just to say, this is what I need. This is what I want. This is what I expect with kindness, you know, not with aggression or, but, but assertive. And when we over, when we begin to explain, and this is because of this, and this is because of that. And then it's, it's, uh, then we give people, we give people um, a point where they can put the lever to try to, to, to push us to not, you know, to take our boundary back or to set it somewhere else. Um, and of course, saying that like that, the apologizing and the, and the over explaining already points towards what makes setting boundaries difficult is because of course we're changing, we're changing the rules of engagement we've set with someone else. And, and this will always and always create pushback. It just starts with the human mind does not like change. So even if a small change occurs, even if you say to your colleagues, can we you know, go to lunch at five past and not at 12, that will already create a pushback. Um, so, um, and we know that, we anticipate that, of course, we're aware of that, that we, when we change, um, when we change rules in our relationships that people will react to that and the more sensitive the topic is and the more we anticipate that people might feel criticized or might disrespect our, our new set boundaries the more sort of apprehensive we are in setting that boundary in the first place it's because it's uncomfortable it's really really uncomfortable to set a boundary it's not nothing that we would wake up and think you who i'm really looking forward to doing this today so that's also why we mostly don't communicate our boundaries or we don't set them deliberately mm. because just as a, as a side note we do have boundaries everyone has boundaries the difference is have you set them deliberately or have you, you know, let them develop and grow out of that situation and fall wherever they're falling? Because they, everything you do and everything you interact um, with people, there is rules for engagement. There is, you know, if, you're, if your supervisor just expects you to work on a Saturday, then that's because the rule for this relationship, the boundary for this relationship is set that that's okay. And then when we want to move that boundary and put it somewhere else, because that's actually not okay for us, then we're going to we anticipate the pushback. And it will, you know, it makes us uncomfortable. So what do people do instead? You know, usually even sometimes we, we change boundaries and we don't communicate it. We just say nothing. That's the passive boundary changing or the passive aggressive. Like we, we say, um, yeah, well, as well for you to do this on a Saturday, it can be, you know, you know how passive aggression works. So we, we, we express our anger without, without saying I'm angry about this. And then there's um, also aggression, you know, some people can, can get really abusive in this situation. And there's also um, manipulation where we try to manipulate uh, into setting the boundary somewhere else. But but none of these will eventually really keep your self calm and your relationship healthy because the only way of communicating a boundary that has the power to do that is an assertive communication of a boundary. Um, and then also to expect to accept when other people set boundaries in the same way. And if there is some conflict to then try to find a compromise that works for both people hence the you know healthy middle of the boundaries not too rigid not too porous and it's a it's a constant it's under constant development it won't be it won't be static it will change over time but to this discomfort that we feel when we when we actively decide we're going to change um a rule of of in our relationships, that is something that will always be there. And that's something that we're gonna have to accept. And it helps to kind of a little bit to switch the thinking from, this is something bad I do. This is something that's gonna hurt this person, or this is something that's gonna hurt me, or 
um, these kind of thoughts that our mind usually sends us in this situation to this is something I do to repair this relationship so that it can be sustained. If we don't have these boundaries set in a way that we can have a healthy relationship, we will eventually, this relationship will eventually deteriorate and end and cause us a lots and lots of heart ache in the process. So it's a, it's a short term discomfort uh, over the long term slow progress of the relationship downwards. Yeah. Um, and I guess one thing that comes to mind is, um, I guess, as grad students, we all have supervisors and some supervisors may not be receptive to changing boundaries. Their boundaries might be rigid. So yeah. is there anything people can do to deal with that? It's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just took a deep breath. <laughs> so what I would do in the first place is to question that belief that they will react that way and to actually put it to the test. Um, because most of us will have potential for improvement in the boundary setting area so if we've never gone deliberately about expressing what it is that we can accept and not accept in the way they treat us then we can't really be sure that they won't accommodate us I think many people are actually receptive to being directly asked to respect us humans and our needs. Um, if you are in a relationship to a supervisor who, who is not at all willing to accommodate your needs, then this is going to be a very damaging relationship for you in the long term. And I would generally begin to work the process of getting out of this relationship. I know this is easily said, as in took me like two seconds to say that, and has massive and huge consequences. And for some people, even more than others. So for some people, even their right to stay in a country might depend on the situation. And then of course, finances usually depend on it. And then, of course, the, the academic career, the whole future prospect. However, um, everything is always a lot more fear inducing, as in super, super scary, once we start, the, before we start the process, before we started taking action. So a lot of these difficulties in changing supervisors ending an absolute toxic relationship are actually things that can be figured out. <laughs> Marie Foley always says everything is figure outable and um, I think there's something to it. The thing is that this is an uncomfortable situation and it will and there is no you know there is no easy way out. There's no I, I can switch my fingers and there's suddenly a magical third way of solving the situation. If you stay in a relationship with a supervisor that is absolutely not open to res respect your needs as a human being, then this costs you your physical and mental health. It will. There's um, and it's I often I often hear I just stick it out until it's over and then it will be over and everything is going to be fine again. And this is unfortunately not how it works. This is not how the human psyche works. The human psyche gets damaged the same way an organ gets damaged or, or a limb. Um, so it's not that once the stressor is turned off, it just bounces back to where it was before. Um, so the costs of staying in this relationship are, are, are high and they probably outweigh 
the costs of um, that come with changing, with trying to find a new, um, you know, a new position, a new supervisor, a new, a new way forward, even leaving um, the whole graduate studies. So I know, but this is we are talking now the absolute extreme, um, and I think that this is actually much much rarer than we think it is. I know it occurs. Um, most supervisors are going to be in some way amenable to being talked to, especially when that talking is very clear, structured, and comes from an assertive place. And if you feel like, you know, if I always say, if you don't feel like you can do this, then you are in a situation where you're not going to need to get support. You are in a situation that is not good for you, and there is people that can help, you know. And I know this varies a lot also from situation to situation on how far, but if you if you're able to access, you know, the support of a good therapist or the support of um, um, a good mentor or any of these kind of things that will be better than no support. Yeah, but I think that, I don't know, I would pro probably put like 98% of all supervisors are going to be in some way um responsive to boundary setting that's yeah that is um it's good to know that most people um should be responsive to boundary setting um it's unfortunate that people do exist that are not going to be responsive um yeah. but definitely um I agree with the I, I, I hear it myself very often that you just have to get through it and then you'll be done but um, it was something that was brought up in our um, episode with um, Eloise Devance she said that a lot of people talk about getting through it but she found that or the the people that have been in her situation have found that it's not like that there is a whole lot of damage that is done there is a whole lot of behaviors that you get into to survive because you get into this survival mode and it's very hard to get yourself out of that yes i I'm, i mean this this connects to my to my personal experience as well because i actually only went into treatment after i defended I was even a few months into a postdoc because I also had had this belief that I, if I just make it to the end and beyond, everything will be fine. And I was absolutely not prepared for being hit by that depressive episode that came after I actually, it was after the constant stressors were gone. I think the a lot of that sympathetic activation I had in my body that was the adrenaline and the cortisol that carried me through my day to day after that was kind of receding, then I was left with the aftermath of, of having gone to a three years of stress. And, um, and, and then, you know, it took me, I was in, in therapy for four years and I would still be, and I want again, I mean, I actually came in the meantime to <laughs> do the conviction that we all should be a therapist, just permanent therapy, just permanently. Um, but um, just the same, you have like a coach or, a, you know, a body, a personal, like a coach for your physical health or a doctor, you also need someone for your, for your mind and your psyche. But um, yeah, so um, that is just not true. And people, you know, people, we throw around the term trauma more and more for a wider range of things, but I think it is not misplaced. I think that we can get traumatized by our PhD experience. Um, and that means we will have a, a full set of triggers as well that can send us back to where we were um, easily and fast. And these triggers also they it's you know, it's not that <clears throat> after grad school we will never experience again working with difficult people or being under time pressure or having the need to perform, uh, feeling the need to perform over uh, maintaining our 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 health mentally and emotionally and physically. So the triggers will come after grad school and if we haven't learned, if we haven't healed 
what what got damaged um, during grad school and maybe also before because many of us we've gone with risk factors into this experience then then this will just be something that will follow us throughout our lives for different jobs so i all you know i wish i wish everyone would would get support much much earlier and faster than than they do um because everyone myself included and that's also what the literature uh, says is that people tend to wait until rock bottom is hit and um yeah people go get support now you know absolutely this isn't this is not how it needs to be <laughs> <laughs> yeah shout out i know yeah. You do not need to be in crisis to be in therapy. Go to therapy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, Absolutely. being in crisis, being in crisis can look different from from what we think it looks. You know, it, it looks different from um, I can't get out of bed anymore and I don't want to be here anymore, or um, or being completely crippled by anxiety. It's actually you know people call about call talk about high functioning anxiety you know like it doesn't need to look like the way we think it looks when we are in crisis so i think i didn't realize for a long time how bad how bad i was um because i still held it all together but with a force and an energy and a, and it was just absolutely exhausting you know yeah yeah i guess um going back to boundaries after yeah. that heavy topic is is hard but um I guess one thing that could be on people's minds and I guess it's a question on my mind is when your boundary comes up against someone else's boundary and you have to compromise what is a healthy way to go about that yeah well I think it becomes very difficult to treat that sort of from the abstract uh, without going into an example so do you do you think did you think of an example for something like this or shall we try to think of of one together um okay let's say um you want to work from home mm -hmm. you want to continue working from home more yeah. days than, than not and your supervisor doesn't want that yeah they want you to be in the lab full time yeah how do we come to a compromise of maybe I don't know um you are don't have to be in the lab when you don't have lab work to do or you maybe take one day a week at home yeah um one of the questions we can always ask ourselves is what we're actually trying to achieve with our wish. So what are we actually trying to achieve with work from home? Mm -hmm. So for example, work from home for many people that can mean I actually only work well in an environment where it's quiet. Um, so this is for me is the productive day so I can work from home or there can be other reasons but what is underlying and the way and the way we get to this is like just by asking ourselves so what would that give me and what would that give me and what would that give me and then we have our you know then this can be it can be a list and we can feel into which one is actually the most important one for us and and then we can see once we got there we can see if we can um, fulfill that need in a different way than working from home um, so that is that is that is one path this can this can take and then also the supervisor what do they want to achieve by not letting us work from home um, what's the motivation behind that are they in need of control or do they do they worry that the team communication will suffer or, you know, again, going into what's lying underneath their, their, um, their need and what they expect and then see if there's some way of connecting what they need on a, on an underlying level with what we need on an underlying level that is maybe less extreme as I work from home or I don't work from home. And of course, one would think the the um the i don't know the easiest way to solve this is to compromise and say 
uh, you know, on days like or once once a week or something. And I know very well that some supervisors are not open to that. Um, and then again, it's I think it's important to go into what is that? What is that? about is underlying that, that they're not open to that. They might actually be just under a university-wide um, regulation or uh, instruction. So they might not, there might be less flexibility and less sort of harmful intent <laughs> behind that strictness and rigidity that they show than, than, we, than we think. Um, so going into the details like that is also then to ask ourselves, so what is this actually that we want from this situation? Um, what is the ultimate goal here? If the ultimate goal is to have some peaceful concentration time, or if the ultimate goal is to, I don't know what it what it could be in the individual, but it will vary. It will vary what the ultimate goal is for a person. And then to see if, um, to take this into, into the dialogue and say, what I need is, um, I need this this uh, quiet concentration time. I can't concentrate in the in the office or something like that. But then there's also possibilities to see if we can find what we need in a different way. For example, as in I can work, um, I can work uh, in the library. I can I can find myself a quiet space in the library, or maybe if if it's related, you know, that not wanting to work in the office to um, to fears of, for example, um, um, Corona or or to not wanting to be in uh, commuting and spending that time commuting, then again, I think it's always good to take it from that bigger level and look at what's lying underneath and then see if, if there's other ways of of giving us that what we need without having to create this big conflict with our supervisor because of course at the end we are sitting in the less powerful seat so this is a difficult relationship because the supervisor will always be more powerful and also we don't want to create additional conflicts with our supervisor we already have enough um <clears throat> but um I mean, there are there's reasons that they have that they want people to come in that we might not understand um, on the surface. And of course, if it's if it's like you have to be physically here to use the lab or use some machines or use the supercomputer or something, it will be very difficult to work around that. But um, in the end, we're trying to figure out what's okay for us and see if we can get that need covered, maybe in a different way than what we were first thinking. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I think that is an important thing to think about. What exactly are we looking for? What need are we trying to get covered? Because it can be sometimes hard when you're not used to it to sit down and think about that. It might take some time. Um, I think my therapist would agree. <laughs> 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 um. But um, also, uh, sometimes I don't sit down and think about it enough, um, but it comes with time and it comes with practice. You get better at it. <laughs> yeah, it also comes with it also comes with getting better at giving us the space to be less stressed. So as long as we are in stress, as long as we are in a fight and flight reaction, it will be very difficult to think about things um rationally awesome yeah. and um we are nearly out of time we've been talking for quite a while so I guess mm. before we end is there anything else that you would like to bring in either about boundaries or about yourself or anything yes yeah um so I I've been uh, steadily building uh, over the last year um something I call the academic life community and I have a vision of uh, this becoming a community of people to support each other right now mostly it is uh, individuals that do one on work work with me but I have uh, recently um hatched a new plan I'm planning to um to create groups of PhD students, six PhD students who live uh, in the same time zone that connect virtually. So there's no need to be in the same physical location. 
and they will meet once a week or every, every other week for a virtual writing retreat where they just sit together and make a, a goal setting and just um, have a little bit of space of connecting and giving each other support and feedback as well. But mostly just to have someone, oh yeah, you're in the same situation as me. And then they will also work monthly on a topic that I will present with material that I will prepare. So I will also give the program for the writing retreat as in you know just follow these steps but then I will also give uh, handouts or workbooks every month about a topic and that could be a topic like boundary setting or it could be a topic like imposter syndrome or the inner critic or writer's block or you know all these many different topics um, and then everyone different groups will join together with me every other month in in uh, in, a, in a live training and this is a absolute pilot study pilot study I wanted to say no it's not it's a project it's not a study uh, but um yeah, so I, I don't know in how far this is going to work and we, I'm sure we will adapt it uh, along the way, but they're going, I'm, I'm, you know, we're about to launch, I, I have 60 people who say I'm ready to go, so um, I'm calling them the PWAGs, which stands for PhD Writing and um, Accountability Groups, and if you're interested, you can read more about that on my webpage at juliajones.bk for Denmark, I'm German, but I live in Denmark. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter at juliajones.dk, where the dot is spelled out, D-O-T. Um, and of course, yeah, I'll, I'll just love connecting with everyone. I absolutely believe that um, support from the peer community uh, can make an, a huge, huge, huge difference in this in this experience. The same way you're creating this this community around these podcasts and you know bringing these conversations out there and to say, hey, you know, this is this is something that we all um that's on all our minds and that we all struggle with and that we need to talk about and 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 also find the beauty in it you know so yeah awesome um thank you so much for being a guest thank you for talking about this important topic because uh i don't there is more talk about boundaries but it's very hard to really nail down how to go about it and also, just in general, boundaries are hard. <laughs> <laughs> boundaries are hard. I, I, whole, I wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly recommend this book by um, Nedrat Tawab if for anyone who wants to have a, a deep dive into boundary setting. Maybe we can put that in Amazing. the show notes somewhere. Absolutely, we will. Yes, definitely. So um, thank you so, so much for being a guest. This has been amazing. So this has been Grad Chat by PhD Balance. Our episodes are now posted simultaneously on our podcast and YouTube channel every second Saturday. You can connect with PhD Balance on our website at phdbalance.com or on social media on Twitter and Instagram at phd underscore balance. Until next time, goodbye and take care of yourself.